uh, God told us about the creation. In chapter 3, he told us about the big mess. Adam and Eve, our grandparents, sinned, and when they sinned, we were in their loins, and we sinned with them, and we're held responsible. In chapters 4 and 5, God told us about Cain killing Abel, and then about the birth of Seth. With the birth of Seth, God said, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. In those two chapters, we have the genealogy of Cain and the genealogy of Seth, the genealogy of an ungodly line, the genealogy of a godly line. In chapter 6 through 8, we learned about the terrible flood. The world was wicked, wicked, wicked. God wiped it out with the exception of Noah and his family and uh, a handful of animals. And we looked at that last week. And it's incredibly credible. And I hope that you have a high view of the flood now. Yeah, I'm sure most of you did anyway, but it's nice to look at some of the evidence supporting that. Uh, chapter 9 is a chapter in which we learn about the events immediately following the flood, the immediate post-Diluvian era. Diluvian, uh, post-Diluvian is made up of two words, post meaning after, and Diluvian from the Latin word diluvium, which means deluge or flood. So this is the the era immediately after the flood. Let's read about it. In uh, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 9, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from every, and each man, excuse me, and from each man too, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. Now, this is a very powerful statement, and it helps explain a lot of what's going on in the world today. And we're going to look at it in, in, in some, some detail. Again, <clears throat> the post-Diluvian world is the time after the flood. Post is after Diluvian speaks of the deluge, the time after. We spent a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the antediluvian period, the time before the flood. And I'm not trying to give you too many fancy words, but I'm giving you a handful of them so you can read books. The problem that some Christians have, they pick up books on, that are written by guys who have wonderful things to say, but they don't sometimes understand the language. So, so every so often I pop in these 75 cent words so you'll at least be able to, be able to read books Time after the flood is good, but you need to know what post-Diluvian and anti-Diluvian mean as well. Now, <clears throat> the, the post-Diluvian world was new to Noah and his family, and it was very different from the world they left behind when they got on the ark uh, a year earlier. And there were two immediate post-Diluvian changes. Those two changes were these. God gave mankind a very different physical environment, and God gave mankind a very different social environment. We're going to look at each in detail. God gave mankind a very different physical environment, and the primary reason why the world was so different uh, after the flood than it was before the flood was because of this. Prior to the flood, there was a water vapor canopy that covered the earth. Now, I'll read a passage of scripture from you shortly, from Genesis 1, in which God separated the waters from above from the waters below. The waters below, we think about oceans, rivers, lakes, and the like. And then there were the waters above. There's apparently a water vapor canopy prior to the flood. The part of the flood waters were that water cape vapor canopy raining down on the earth, and it was never replaced. That water vapor canopy made the earth 
like a giant greenhouse, and it was very lush, it was very fruitful, and uh, life was a little bit easier prior to the flood. But with the flood, that canopy was lost, and the world became a much more difficult place in which to live. It was then that God said, you can eat animals as well. Notice, before the flood, I gave you plants to eat, and that would have been sufficient. Why was that sufficient? Because they lived in a giant greenhouse. And in greenhouses, things grow well. When you lose the greenhouse, things don't grow so well. So God said, in order for you to, to, to get enough to eat now, I'm going to let you eat animals as well. We'll read these passages in a moment. That's part of the change that took place after the flood. Now, let's read about this water vapor candy, the space in between. Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters. What waters? The waters below and the waters above. The oceans, lakes, rivers below, that water vapor canopy above. Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. The earth lost the greenhouse effect of the water vapor canopy with the flood. The earth was simply not as lush as it had once been. So life on earth is going to get more difficult, and it's been difficult ever since. I'm not suggesting that it was all that easy before the flood, but it was a lot easier than it was before the, uh, it was a lot easier before the flood than it was after the flood. Henry Morris wrote, "Much of the world's water was stored above the sky in the form of a vast blanket of invisible water vapor." which produced a marvelous greenhouse effect <clears throat> over the Earth's entire surface. This, in turn, produced a uniformly mild and warm climate everywhere all year long, with no rainstorms. There were extensive land surfaces covered with lush vegetation and abundant animal life all over the world. This was our situation before the flood. After the flood, things were very different. The Earth no longer was uh, water by a mist, now we had rain, which we still have, sometimes a little more than we want. Genesis 2, 4 through 6, When the Lord made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub in the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. This is talking about the time before the flood. No rain. And there was no man to work the ground, but streams or mist came up from the earth, and watered the whole surface of the ground. So you got an idea of what the world was like before the flood. That's the reason I'm uh, putting in these passages of Scripture, because I want you to see from the Scripture uh, the support for the statements I've just made. So the loss of the water vapor canopy may gave the world a harsher environment. Food became more difficult to obtain. And this is probably why many animals became extinct. Now, most of you... Uh, uh, I don't know if you believe, I guess most of you probably believe in a young earth. Some of you believe in an old earth. I'm not going to beat that thing to death. I believe in a young earth. Uh, I believe the earth is about six, 7,000 years old, certainly less than 10,000 years old. I don't want to get too dogmatic, but I believe in a young earth. I think that uh, there's a lot of biblical support for it. And frankly, I'd much rather turn to God for answers to issues like this than to a bunch of guys in lab coats at Harvard. Um, <laughs> If you have ever noticed, and I'm not anti-science. People say that we're Peter, people of faith, we're narrow-minded, we don't believe in education and science. That's, that's not, nothing can be further from the truth. There are absolutely tens of thousands of scientists who are solid believers, who believe in a young earth. At any event, I lost my point. I had something profound to say, and I forgot what it was. Oh, <laughs> what became extinct? Probably the so-called prehistoric animals lived before the flood. They lived from the time of creation up until the time of the flood. And they became extinct because life after the flood was just too harsh, too difficult for them to survive in. So it's believed, and we don't know this to be true. I, I hasten to add we don't know. But I think there's good reason to believe that the prehistoric animals or animals that lived prior to the time of the flood. And if you go through the book of Job, and eventually we will work our way to the book of Job, uh, we will get there. I know some of you doubt that, but we will get there, Lord willing. Uh, Job talked about some very interesting animals. 
that may very well have been dinosaurs. And some people believe that Job lived prior to the time of the flood. I tend to think that that's probably true. And that uh, those animals, those prehistoric animals, the dinosaurs and the like, he describes some of them that would fit the descriptions that we have of prehistoric animals. Uh, those animals became extinct because after the flood, the world was just too harsh for them to survive. So many animals became extinct because this harsh new world was difficult for them to survive in, and God knew it would be difficult for us to survive in, which is why he gave us, allowed us now to eat meat. Genesis 9, verses 3 and 4. Everything that lives and moves will be feed for you, food for you, just as I gave you green plants. That is, prior to the time of the flood, you had green plants. I now give you everything, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. Okay? You're with me. The loss of the water vapor canop canopy gave the world a harsh environment. Food became more difficult to obtain. And uh, the third major point is the earth was subject to more ultraviolet light and cosmic rays. That water vapor canopy served as a shield against uh, ultraviolet light and cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are believed to be the primary driving force behind mutation. Now, if you talk to evolutionists, they'll tell you that that is the primary reason for mutation, that mutations lead to evolution. Now, I don't believe in evolution, but I absolutely do believe in mutations. Prior to the flood, uh, we had this water vapor canopy that was a shield against cosmic rays and ultraviolet light, which is what prevented a lot of the mutations that we saw after the flood. Now, why is that significant? For two primary reasons. If you, know, if you read through the first few chapters of Genesis, you find people lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Methuselah lived for 969 years. Noah was 600, no, Noah was 600 years old when he got into the ark. That meant he, he spent 120 years building it, and he, was, he, spent it, he spent most of his time building that ark while he was 500-plus years old. Man, I couldn't, I, can't, I couldn't build a sawhorse, and I'm 73. <laughs> now, he was powerful. He was strong. Why? Because that, was that, that water vapor canopy is a really big deal. Not only did it give us a greenhouse effect and make the world lush, which is why God didn't give us animals to eat, but it prevented a lot of mutations. And this scientists agree. They'll tell you that the cosmic rays are the primary reason for uh, mutations. There can be other causes as well. Don't misunderstand, but that's the primary cause. Well, what happened was, once that shield was gone, lots of mutations. With those mutations, lifespan dropped dramatically. Notice after the flood, People didn't live nearly as long as before. In fact, we lost about 90% of our life expectancy after the flood. Why? That water vapor shield was gone. Also, before the flood, close relatives could marry. There was no problem. Who did Adam and Eve's children marry? They married their brothers and sisters, folks. That wasn't a problem. Why do we not want that today? Because of mutations. Because what you'll end up with a bunch of recessive genes getting together from one family, and you end up with mutated children, which is why societies don't want close relatives to marry, which is also why God said, I don't want close relatives to marry. In 185, Leviticus 18.9, do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same house or elsewhere. In short, prior to the flood, there was life. Prior to the flood, we had the water vapor canopy, which canopy which prevented cosmic rays and ultraviolet light from causing mutations, which meant that men, men and women lived longer. Also, it was okay for close relatives to have sexual relations because we didn't have all these mutant genes. After the flood, with the loss of the water vapor canopy, lots and lots of mutations, so God prohibited uh, close relatives from marrying. Let's continue on. That was our first point. The point was, after the flood, God gave mankind a very different physical environment. He also gave mankind a very different social environment. And that was laid down in verses, verse 6 of chapter 9, where God implicitly gave us human government. God said, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, 
has God made man? What God was saying is this, and this is brand new, folks. Chapter 9, brand new. If this man kills the man next to him, we kill him. God instituted capital punishment. Now, I'm really sort of tired of hearing clergymen say that capital punishment is inconsistent with the word of God. That, that's simply not the case. People say, well, we're no longer under the Mosaic law. That's true, but this has nothing to do with the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law won't come for another 1,000 or 1,500 years. After the flood, God gave us human government. That's implied in this. Human government means that we're supposed to enforce righteousness. What had happened prior to the flood is the world had grown more and more and more wicked to such a point that God looked around and found one righteous man, Noah. He doesn't speak of anyone else being righteous. After the flood, God says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you human government. Maybe with human government, you guys can enforce a measure of righteousness. In fact, the book of Romans talks about governments enforcing a measure of righteousness. Now, to be sure, our governments are often pretty bankrupt and themselves the cause of much difficulty. But if you looked at areas of the world where there are no governments, you'll find they're usually much worse than areas that have governments, even if some of those times those governments are oppressive. So what happened was, after the flood, God gave us human government, and governments don't work unless they can pass laws and enforce those laws. And so basically what God was saying in just making this one statement about capital punishment, God was implying all lesser punishments. The ultimate punishment that can be laid against any individual is capital punishment, death, right? So implied under that are all lesser in punishments. So God, God did after the flood was he gave us human government. Now nothing like this had been ordained prior to the flood. When Cain slew Abel, God said, I'll take care of the matter. He didn't say, oh, by the way, uh, having brought before the tribunal, you try and find him guilty and executed. God said nothing of the sort. Prior to the flood, God took care of that issue. And then when Lamech slew a man who had injured him, God did not tell men or governments to punish him. God, in fact, took care of it. So nothing like this, this had been given prior to the flood. God, as I pointed out, indirectly established government by giving men the authority to punish wrongdoers. You're with me on this. Big deal, human government, <laughs> with the right to punish wrongdoers. So God gave mankind human government, and the principle for governing was that the punishment should match, match the crime. As I pointed out earlier, when God gave us the right, in fact, in a certain sense, the obligation to execute murderers, all lesser punishments are implied. Men were being given authority to pass laws. Men were being given authority to punish those who broke the laws. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Now, this is a principle that's called in Latin lex talionis. And if you read books on history, they'll talk about it at length. It's a principle that God laid down in the ninth chapter of Genesis. Lex talionis in the principle. Lex talionis means that the Punishment should match the crime. The punishment should match the crime. And this principle spread throughout the earth after the flood. The earliest non-biblical record of lex talionis, that is the punishment matching the crime, was found in the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a king of Babylon who lived a hundred or so years before Moses. So the idea of lex talionis, the idea of a punishment matching the crime was a principle that spread throughout the world. And it began when God said, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Now this principle was given greater detail by Moses in the Mosaic Law on page 187. Let me turn to it. In Exodus 21, Moses is writing, if men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the hu woman's husband demands that the and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Could you get more specific than that? What's the point? Lex talionis. What I want is I want the punishment to match the crime. 
what God is saying this, I don't, I don't want uh, a tooth crime to, I don't want a, a tooth crime should have a tooth punishment. A tooth crime should not have a bruise punishment. You get the point? This is a really important principle that spread throughout the world. God ordained it immediately after the flood. And uh, as I pointed out in Leviticus, Moses continued, if anyone takes the life of a human being, he must be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, tooth as he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. Great principle. This is how governments are supposed to operate. Now, I'm not suggesting there is not room for mercy. God also works in mercy throughout the scriptures. But there's got to be a principle of lex talionis, a principle the governments operate on, that the punishment should match the crime. You don't fine a guy $25 for murder. At the same time, you don't give him 20 years in prison for a parking ticket. Th are things a little skew out there? The punishment has got to match the crime. That was God's whole point. Continuing on, <clears throat> God gave mankind government, the governing principle, the punishment should match the crime. Now, there are two timeless standards for dealing with, wrong with wrongdoers, two timeless standards. God's standard for governments, an eye for an eye. God's standard for individuals, turn the other cheek. Now, for 40 years as a believer, I've heard people tell me that these are contradictory. Uh, there is an eye for an eye, and then there is turn the other cheek. See, the Bible's filled with contradictions, they say. I, I just want to say, I, I, when people don't know anything about the Bible and start talking about the contradictions, it drives me nuts. Sadly, I find Christians saying much the same thing. Or they will say, well, the, in the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye. That's how you're supposed to deal with wrongdoers. But in the New Testament, we're supposed to turn the other cheek. Wrong. They're both timeless. And there's no contradiction. One was given to governments, and the other was given to individuals. I'm just trying to summarize what we're going to go through in detail in just a moment. To governments, God says, in order to govern and enforce a measure of righteousness, you're going to have to have laws. In order for laws to work, there has to be a punishment for those who break the laws. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to match up the penalty with the crime. Is that hard? We haven't figured it out, but that's not hard. To the individual, God says, I want you to turn the other cheek. Your neighbor does you wrong. Now, he's not talking about self-defense here, so don't get extreme on it. Your, your neighbor does you wrong. God is saying to the government, you're the president. I'm making you president for a moment. I know. I know. I don't blame you. I wouldn't want the job either. A neighbor comes over, robs him, takes out his, his new TV set. His, that gigantic 60-inch flat-screen TV he's got on the wall. He stole it, and he knows the guy stole it because it's over there. Now, he's a tough guy. He's got a couple of kids. They're all Pennsylvania hunters loaded with guns. I'm not a liberal, folks. Sounded like one, though, didn't I? I, I don't watch CNN. I really don't. Now, your job, Mr. President, is to get his TV back and or plus punish the man who stole his TV. Now, you're not going to give him a lifetime sentence for stealing your TV. You're going, to, you're going to punish him in a way that matches the crime. But if, like too many government officials, you fail to do your job, now you say, well, he failed to do his job. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go punish my neighbor. God says, no. Your job is to turn the other cheek. Your job is to forgive. You see what's going on here? There are two standards. You as the government are supposed to punish wrongdoers, and the punishment has got to match the crime. You as an individual, when you're done wrong, God says, I want you to turn the other cheek. I want you to forgive. One standard is for government. One standard is for individuals. And you're going to say, but the government stinks. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. I'm going to take justice into my own hands. God says, no. To which you say, but what? Where's justice here? He failed. The president, the, the president of the country failed to do what he's supposed to do. God says, that's okay. I'll take care of it myself. 
and I'll get to those passages of Scripture. I want you to get the, the overarching picture here. There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction whatsoever. Now, what some will say, and they love to quote the Sermon on the Mount. And they'll say, Sermon on the Mount is New Testament standards as opposed to the old. And in the New Testament, Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount is a great, great sermon. It's recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's one of our Lord's greatest sermons. And in this sermon, really what he was doing, he was not giving us New Testament rules and regulations. What he was really doing was explaining the Old Testament law. He was, it's really an exposition on the Old Testament law. This is what the Old Testament law meant all along. J Jesus said, for example, uh, you heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her. His heart. This isn't new. That's what the root meaning of adultery was in the Old Testament. Notice what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not giving his New Testament rules and regulations. He's not giving us a New Testament standard of righteousness. What he's doing, he was trying to help the Jews interpret the Old Testament law correctly. They had fouled up the interpretation. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother has been subject to judgment. In short, let me tell you, the root, the root sin in murder is anger and hatred. It wasn't something brand new in the New Testament era. That's the way it had always been. What he was trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount was, was give them an exposition on the Old Testament law. What he's saying, folks, you know all those rules and regulations that you've been reading about in the Old Testament? You've been interpreting them incorrectly. Let me give you the root meaning for all of them. Again, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. People say, aha, right there, Jesus did away with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and implemented turning the other cheek. No, he didn't. What, he was do what had happened was the Jews had taken this principle of an eye for an eye that governments are supposed to follow, and they had adopted it for themselves as individuals. As individuals say, the, 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 the president didn't, didn't do what he was supposed to do, so you said, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll execute judgment myself. An eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. So, so write in the book. God says, no, no, no. But they had done is they had taken government principles and started applying them to, in, in, to individuals. So the Sermon on the Mount was, in fact, an exposition of Old Testament law. God wasn't replacing any of those principles. He was just simply telling people what they were supposed to mean. Now, there are two timeless principles for dealing with wrongdoers. God's standards for government, an eye for an eye. You all understand that. God's standard for individuals, turn the other cheeks. He does not want vengeance. Can you imagine a society, and there are societies, where individuals go out and seek vengeance on their own? It's madness. You have chaos. And that's one of the problems they have in Honduras. It's part of their culture is seeking vengeance. And as a result, they have the highest murder rate, per capita murder rate in the world. Why? Because part of their culture is individuals have adopted an eye for an eye for themselves rather than letting the government do it. God says, I don't want that. I don't want that. These two standards are part of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me read some passages of Scripture for you. The God's, God's standard for governments is an eye for an eye. This was the standard in the Old Testament. This is the standard in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 24, if anyone takes the life of a human being, he must be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make, rest, make restitution, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever has, he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so forth. But it's also a New Testament standard. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 13. Everyone must submit himself to gov the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. For the government is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for the government does not bear the sword for nothing. What do you do with sword? You execute people. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So the idea of an eye for an eye is not just an Old Testament standard, folks. It is a New Testament standard as well. I read you passages from both the Old and New Testament. But it was only given to whom? Thank you. <laughs> Men, turn the other cheek. Now, someone say, ah, oh, turn the other cheek. That's all New Testament. No, it isn't. Let me read some passages.
from the Old Testament, Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, kill him, right? Well, it's an eye for an eye. It's Old Testament, right? I'm reading, you know, I'm reading from Proverbs. No, no, no. Proverbs 25, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. Sounds like Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Proverbs 24, do not testify against your neighbor without cause or use your lips to deceive. Do not save. Say, I will do to him as he has done to me. That's eye for an eye, isn't it? Do not say that. Who's God talking to? This is Old Testament. Don't say that. Don't say, I'll pay that man back for what he did. This sounds more like turning the other cheek, doesn't it? Deuteronomy 32, it is mine to avenge, God says, I will repay. So the principle of turning the other cheek is not just New Testament, it's Old Testament as well. And then, of course, it's in the New Testament. We're all familiar with that in, in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. You've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If one strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, there are two timeless standards for dealing with wrongdoers. God's standard for governments, an eye for an eye. And God's standard for individuals is turn the other cheek. And the whole thing is just incredibly brilliant. I'll tell you why it's incredibly brilliant. Because your neighbor came over and sold your big screen TV. Now it's the president's responsibility to punish him correctly, right? Which just makes it a whole lot easier for you to forgive him, doesn't it? Huh? <laughs> That's a very weak yes. Very weak yes. Now you're sounding like a Marine. <laughs> No, you see, my neighbor does me wrong. The government steps in and punishes my neighbor for the wrong he's done me. That makes it a whole lot easier for me, me, to forgive him. Now, some would say, well, if the, if the government doesn't do it, then I have to do it. God says, no, you don't do that. And one of the reasons is the world, the society would be chaotic. And the other reason is because individuals seeking uh, uh, to, to punish those who've done them wrong will almost always overdo it. Let me give you a sad example. Well, I, I can tell you this. I grew up places in the South where if you slapped a man, he'd probably beat you to death. If you go to, to Appalachian, those, some of those places back in Lach Appalachia, you Yankees think of all, all the Southerners as rednecks. Let me tell you, growing up in the South, we thought of people in the hills as rednecks. I mean, there were some tough dudes back in there. And uh, if you slapped a guy, he might beat you to death. Well, he was angry, and he, he did it. You understand what happens? You, see, you seek recompense, and you t individuals tend to overdo it. Let me give you an example. This was a real example from the 1970s in New York City. There was a young hotshot stockbroker who got one of those multi-million dollar bonuses. You've read about them. Yeah, they really do get multi-million dollar bonuses. And he went out and bought himself a brand new Lamborghini, $250,000 car. And he loved it. And I think it was the very day he bought it, he was driving it around Soho, showing it off. And he encountered a bunch of thugs riding around in an old jalopy. They saw that Lamborghini and deliberately crashed into it. They didn't completely disable, but they just crashed into it. And then they started mocking this guy. I mean, there were half a dozen of these guys in the car. He's by himself. They started mocking him and ridiculing him with some hand gestures, and you know how that goes. And then they drove away. This was furious. His brand-new $250,000 Lamborghini had not only been wrecked, they'd mocked him and ridiculed him and belittled him. He lived close by. Went home, got his gun, went back out into Soho, driving around until he found them, and he pumped that jalopy of theirs full of holes. A couple of the guys died. A couple others were wounded. One guy, I think, was paralyzed. And uh, that's how he got back at the guys who did him wrong. Now, what those thugs did was disgusting and outrageous, and if it had been my Lamborghini and and they wrecked it and then mocked me and ridiculed me, I'd be angry too. But killing a man for wrecking my Lamborghini 
ain't a capital offense, is it? Weak? <laughs> Do I have a bunch of Lamborghini drivers here? <laughs> no, that's not a capital offense. Shooting a man for wrecking your car and, 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 and mocking you is not a capital offense. And, and had the government stepped in, arrested those men, taken them to a trial where a jury would have tried them, the jury would not have given those guys uh, a capital punishment for having wrecked the Lamborghini, would they? That's the reason you go to court. But the individual is so angry, he's furious, he overreacts. And that's the problem that we have. That's the reason God didn't say to individuals eye for eye, because he knew if somebody did you dirty, you tend to overreact. You get angry, you fall into a rage, and you overdo it. Today, that stockbroker would agree with me. He, too, wishes it had gone to trial, because now he's doing 30 years to life. So he gets to spend every day in jail saying, I wish I hadn't sought revenge on my own. I wish it had gone to a jury. The jury would hopefully punish them appropriately. This is why God said when it comes to handling wrongdoers, government, your job is eye for eye. Punish people in a way that matches the crime. You as an individual, don't you do that. You'll overreact. You might kill a man for wrecking your Lamborghini. That's natural. We get angry and we overreact, don't we? So your job is to forgive. Now, the president's supposed to do what he's supposed to do, and it makes your job a whole lot easier to forgive if he's doing his job. But what if he doesn't? God says, hands off. I'll take care of it. And I have some passages on that at the end. Deuteronomy 32. It is mine to revenge, God says. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. Romans 12, 19. Do not take revenge, my friend, but leave room for God's wrath. For what is written is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, you have a great system here. When wrongdoer, and how to handle wrongdoers. The, gov the president over here, the government, is supposed to punish them in a way in which the the punishment matches the crime. You as an individual, you'll overreact, stay out of it. You forgive. If the president's doing the job he's supposed to do, then it'll be easier to forgive because the wrongdoer was punished, right? If he isn't, God says, I'll take care of it. It's not the last chapter in this story, as it were. Now, I've, I've thought about this, as you could probably tell, a lot over the last 30 or 40 years. And I found it just a brilliant system. We don't do it the way we're supposed to. But you understand how brilliant it is? Wrongdoers are punished appropriately. You have to leave it up to the government to do it, though. If you leave it to individuals, folks, it'll just be a mess. Look at the Middle East and all those chaotic countries. I'll tell you one of the reasons is they're chaotic is because their governments aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Each individuals are taking it upon themselves. And then you have tribe, and then you go out, you kill your neighbor, and then his brothers and sisters come and kill you, and then your brothers and sisters go out and kill them, and you got the Hatfields and McCoys. You understand why this is such an important principle? And people say, well, they're all being contradictory. No, they're not. So this God standing for government, eye for an eye. God standing for individuals, turn the other cheek. And that's his stand in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. God does expect governments to obey, obey his guidelines. God hates societies that punish the innocent and let criminals go free. Mr. President, pay attention. Proverbs 17, acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests both. God hates it when guilty people are let off because of a, a technicality with the evidence. We let the guilty go free. God says, I hate that. Men and women who are guilty of crime should be punished accordingly, right? At the same time, God says, he hates condemning the innocent. There's a group in New Jersey called the Innocence Project. And maybe someone can help me. I've forgotten the fellow's name who started it. Barry Sheck. Barry Sheck. And uh, most of us don't like Barry Sheck because he helped OJ go free, but nevertheless. The Innocence Project is a very good pro project. What they're doing is they're collecting DNA samples from all sorts of crimes, rape crimes in particular, that resulted in men being put on death row. They found that one-third of the men who are serving life sentences are on death row for rape, 
were innocent. Now, that's scary. God says, I hate that. But you know what? It's having a hard time getting prosecutors to revisit those cases, even though they have solid DNA evidence that a third of those guys are innocent. Why? Because it's an embarrassment to the prosecutors. Now, I'm a law and order guy. Most of us here, most evangelical, conservative, law and order guys, I know about it. I'm a law and order guy. I'm a law and order guy. I really am. But I, I find it abhorrent when prosecutors, to save their own reputations, don't revisit cases where Barry Sheck and the Innocence Project has come in and found men to be innocent. In fact, is if, the gov- if, if Mr. President was doing what he was supposed to do, the minute you got this DNA situation going where you could find out who was guilty and innocent, I w- he should have gone to the Congress and said, give me $10 billion and let's send out 1,000 uh, investigators and clean up every one of them. That's the way society should work. Unfortunately, it doesn't work which is why too often we have men seeking vengeance. God says, I hate acquitting the guilty, and I hate condemning the innocent. Psalm 82, 2, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Ecclesiastes 3, 16, and I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. God expects the government to do its job and do it correctly. God expects individuals to not seek vengeance. And if the government fails, God says, I'll take care of it. There's still another chapter to be written. All right. God hates societies that punish the innocent and let criminals go free. This hatred would also include excessive or deficient punishments. This is a real problem. God says the punishment should match the crime, right? Let's go back to medieval where they hung Young boys for pickpocketing. I'm not exaggerating, folks. They hung them. And then we came to other petty crimes. People were not only hung, they hang them partway until they died. Then they would would, uh, open up their abdomen, pull out their intestines, and they would quarter them. That was excessive punishment. Now, we've done a pretty good job of putting a stop to that. (laughs) Could you imagine hanging Young boys that were 12, 13, 14, 15, hanging them for pickpocketing? You say, that didn't happen. Oh, yes, it did happen. Big time. We've looked at that and we said, I think that's excessive. You bet it's excessive. So what do we do now? We're letting rapists and murderers go free. Or do a, do, a, do, a, do a a deal, a plea deal, where they get five years. And if any of you watch O'Reilly, he's, he's, he's fanatical about these. I mean, you, you, we're constantly being reminded that there are guys out there who are pedophiles who are getting suspended sentences or getting probation. So God doesn't want it excessive, and God doesn't want it too lenient. He wants it to match. How hard is that? God is brilliant, isn't he? We just can't quite get it together. God hates societies to punish the innocent and let criminals go free. This hatred will also include excessive or deficient punishments. The proper punishment does deter crime. The reason I stuck this in here is because I've heard talking heads, liberal talking heads for years tell me that capital punishment doesn't deter crime. Well, it won't deter all the crime, and punishment doesn't deter crime, but God says the punishment does deter crime. Deuteronomy 19, if a malicious witness takes a stand to accuse a man of a crime, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do his brother. That would do a lot, lot to get away with men and women who lie on the, on the witness stand, wouldn't it? Do to him. Oh, I, 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 found, I found this man guilty of murder. I, I saw him do it. And he's innocent. He lied. Then we, what we do is, and that would have been a capital offense. Then he gets the capital offense. That would do a, go a long way stopping lying on the witness stand. Now they get a slap on the wrist. Let me continue. You must purge the evil from among you. Listen. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. Here we keep going. See, this is getting monotonous. But God is trying to pound it in our heads that what we have to do when it comes to handling wrongdoers is give them the punishment 
that their crime deserves. So proper punishment does deter crime. People will hear about this and stop it. So when all those liberals say that, that capital punishment doesn't deter crime, they're wrong. God says they're wrong. Who are you going to listen to? I don't, know, don't answer them. <laughs> all right, this is, a, this is a safe audience. Capital punishment, incidentally, is not incompatible with Christianity. Capital punishment is compatible with Christianity. I've heard clergymen and even the Pope in the last few months say that capital punishment is incompatible with Christianity and nothing can be further from the truth. What have we just read? All those passages of Scripture. You say, well, I'm not under the Old Testament law. Folks, capital punishment was established by God immediately after the flood when he established governments. The Mosaic law wouldn't come along for another 1,000 or 1,500 years. It was not under the Mosaic law. It's God's standard of judgment. Capital punishment was established by God. So when people say it's incompatible with Christianity, I say, well, what book are you reading? It is not incompatible with Christianity. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't room for mercy. We, we, that's not my point at this juncture in the lecture. God always makes room for mercy. But capital punishment is not incompatible with God and Christianity. Clergymen are wrong when they say otherwise. God ordained capital punishment. He God ordered the Israelites to stone Achan and his own family. And sometimes God does it himself. You remember Nadab and Abihu? They were Aaron's sons. They offered strange fire, and God struck them dead with fire. He fired them right away. So not only is it not incompatible, God ordained capital punishment, and sometimes he executes it himself. So when people say it's incompatible with Christianity, they're simply not reading the Bible, which isn't surprising. God gave mankind human government. The governing principle is punishment should match the crime. The, there are two timeless standards for dealing with wrongdoers, eye for eye, and turn the other cheek. God expects governments to obey his guidelines. And frankly, and my last point is don't confuse instructions to governments with instructions to individuals. God's standard for government is an eye for an eye. We've been through this. God's standard for individuals is turn the other cheek. Jesus did not dismiss an eye for an eye when he said, you have read it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I tell you, he, what he was trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount was stop those individuals who were taking the government's principle and applying it to an individual. That's all he was doing. Continuing on. Both principles are in play today. They do not contradict each other because one is for the government and the other is for an individual. You always hear people say they contradict each other. They don't contradict each other at all. And retaliation. Governments are to retaliate, individuals are not to retaliate. Why? Because individuals will invariably over-respond. We just talked about it. Don't forget the Lamborghini. Real, real example. It's scary. Just let it go as an individual. Individuals often overreact, as I just pointed out. An eye for an eye, the principle of retaliation given to governments, turn the other cheek, the principle of retaliation given to individuals. If the government doesn't respond, God will take care of it in time. Deuteronomy, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, the doom rushes upon them. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge. Who's he talking to? Individuals or governments? Thank you. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So that ends the lecture for the evening. But it's amazing how this is confused. I've heard government officials whose responsibility is to punish wrongdoers in a way that matches the crime say, well, you know, we're, we're, the good book says, they give you something like the good book. You know you're in trouble when they use the word good book. You just, just admit it, just do this. The good book says uh, that we're supposed to turn the other cheek. God never said that to governments. He said that to individuals. Again, I, I'm not spending time in all the passages about mercy. The one of my favorite in, is in James where God said that mercy triumphs over judgment. There was always, there's always room for mercy. There are extenuating circumstances. I can imagine, I mean, every so often you get a case where a young girl, uh, kills her father. Why? Because she was molested by her father, and now he, she sees it doing uh, her father doing it to her young sister, and in a rage, shoots him. Well, now, it would have been better if she'd handled it another way. But if I was on the jury, I wouldn't give her. I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote to have her executed for that. There's room for mercy. There's room for extenuating circumstances. David committed adultery and murder. Did God have him executed? 
No, there was room for mercy. So we're, I don't, I'm not trying to suggest when we talk about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that there's no room for mercy in those situations. There are. They're, always, they're often extenuating circumstances. But nevertheless, the principle remains the same. God laid that principle down after the flood. It is timeless for governments, not for individuals. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God. I just pray, Father, that the world in which we live would take these simple principles to heart and do the right thing. Can you imagine? I just, it, it's hard to imagine how much better the world would be. And then we just find these simple rules. I pray that more and more will. But we know ultimately it's not going to really happen until you come, Lord Jesus. So we pray that you will come. You come soon. And then we'll see these principles put into practice. In the meantime, encourage us, I pray. In Jesus' name.